So we're now going to turn our attention to a new case study. And this case study is going to go well above and beyond what we've covered up to this point and show you some really, really cool new features that we haven't discussed, but will become very essential when we do the next programming assignment. So this is called the Quotes, the Quotes Services app. And what it's going to do is we're going to use a bunch of different concurrency frameworks using Spring Web MVC to provide a couple of different quote services. Now, you remember we did the Bera quotes example earlier, and the Bera quotes case study was returning quotes by Yogi Bera. And if you recall, we had one microservice and we had a couple of different implementation strategies that were part of that microservice, but we only had one microservice. And I talked about why that was a bit deficient. The last example we talked about the other day, which was the one about the math services, and, and by the way, all those videos are up on the website now. That had two microservices, but we had to hard code the client to talk directly to each microservice, which had a bunch of deficiencies or limitations. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have multiple microservices, multiple services, one of which will return Zippy the Pinhead quotes, and the other will return Jack Handy quotes, and we'll talk about those examples and why we do those things. But we're going to change things around now so that rather than having the client talk directly to the microservices, instead they're going to talk to something called an API gateway. And the API gateway will be the front end to a bunch of back end microservices. And you'll get a chance to see how all this stuff works. So that's, that's kind of where we're going. And we'll also play around with something called the Eureka Discovery Service. So let's start off. This is actually not the math services case study. This is the quote services case study. That's a typo, which I'll fix. Um, and so what we're going to do is have the client send get requests, which are then going to be received by this gateway, which will then forward things to the appropriate microservice, which will then do the work and send the response back to the client. And this will also show how to use the Eureka discovery service, which is super cool. So the way this is going to work is when the microservices start up, and we're going to have a single uh, run script that will launch all the microservices in the right order. And it's going to start off by like, uh, launching something called the Eureka Discovery Service, which will start first. And then as the other microservices start up, the gateway, the handy application, the zippy application, they will register themselves with the Eureka Discovery Service. So that's one thing to remember. The client will then send requests. After the services are up and running, this client will send requests to the API gateway and only the API gateway. There's no communication from the client to any other microservice but the API gateway. Client doesn't know, doesn't care that there's these other microservices. It doesn't know, it doesn't care there's a discovery service. It just sends it to the gateway. And we'll talk about why we do that in a second. When the API gateway receives a client request, it will use the Eureka discovery service to route the request to the appropriate microservice that's designated in the request. And we'll see how this works. This is really, really, really cool. <laughs> and the Eureka Discovery Service enables the gateway to find and communicate with the backend services without requiring hard coding of ports or host names into the source code itself. Those things are all going to be done through configuration scripts instead. And then what will happen is once the, the uh, request has been forwarded from the gateway to the appropriate microservice, let's say it's the handy one, then that microservice will take the request, do whatever it needs to, and then send a response back to the client. And the, the gateway is no longer involved in that communication. It just is used to basically route the request to the right microservice. So let's talk a little bit about how this project is set up. So we got a lot more pieces now. This is a single project with four modules in it. We're going to have a Eureka module, a gateway module, a microservices module, and a client module. And a couple things to note. We're going to have to write some code here for doing this implementation, although we're going to do some real clever reuse and refactoring that's kind of nice. We have to write some code for the client, of course. But for Eureka and Gateway, there's very little code we have to write. Almost everything is done declaratively. So that, that's something to keep in mind as well. It's really powerful. So here's what the Eureka module looks like. It's got a Eureka folder that has the Eureka application in it. But there's no controller, there's no service, it's just the application. And all it does is it basically has an annotation that says, I want to be a Eureka server, please. So 
We'll talk about that. That contains just the app entry point into that microservice. And it's also got a resources package, which defines the port number that's listened on by the Eureka Discovery Service. And of course, that port number needs to be known by the other services so they know where to go and to contact it to register themselves. And there's a few other things there we'll look at as well. And this is uh, stored in what's called a YAML file, which stands for YAML ain't a markup language. So go figure that one out. Uh, which is sort of a, a recursive acronym that's sort of misleading, but it's clever. The gateway module contains the API gateway. And you can see here it's got a gateway portion in the gateway module. And in this gateway portion, it's got a gateway application and a gateway controller, but there is no gateway service. And again, you'll see that there's very, very, very little code that we have to write to do this stuff. And the reason for that is that we use these YAML files to declaratively specify the port numbers and the microservices and the routes and the filters and the predicates and all this other good stuff that the gateway uses in order to do its thing. So this is almost like magic. And this implements the, the spring cloud gateway mechanism. Then we have the microservices part. This is where we write our business logic for the microservices. And of course, we have the, the, the handy and zippy microservices pieces. And they have the normal things you'd expect. They have an application, a controller, and a service. And we'll see when we look at the implementation that these pieces of code cleverly reuse lots of stuff that comes out of a common set of factored, refactored classes, including base application, base controller, and base service. So these things are just basically extensions of this generic set of stuff. And that's really cool. There's also some other cool things here as well. And then we have the utils directory, which as usual contains helper classes that we use. And then there's a resources folder, which defines various application properties, like the names and the port numbers and the schema definitions for the quotes. And you're going to see we're going to have one of these implementations here. The, uh, the handy microservice uses just a list of quotes. But the zippy microservice, which we're going to talk about next class, uses the Java persistence architecture, the JPA. And so it basically has a persistent database approach. So you get a chance to play around with that as well. Then finally, we have the client, which has a quote driver, which is what sends and receives the requests. And the cool part about this, of course, is it only knows how to talk to the API gateway. It doesn't know how to talk to anything else. <clears throat> it's also got the client package, which provides the proxy and the wrapper that send get requests to the server, to the microservices. And it's got a utils folder, which has all things we've seen a lot before, like web utils and runtimer and so on. And then finally, it's got some resources. And mostly what they allow us to do is be able to set a port number that's used for the client driver. You'll see how that works later. And we also can enable and disable logging, because logging gets a bit tedious after a while uh, for the client program that we're using. So that's the end of the overview of the Quote Services app case study.